global economy is is the big topic. That's what we all care about most. But financial markets can come up with their own narratives and go their own way, at least for a while. So you have to they're not in, in sync. They they do they will be in sync eventually, but uh, not always right away. A lot of times the financial markets get ahead of themselves and then they wake up to reality and they oh crash, you're correct down. So there's a little bit of that going on. But in terms of the global economy, um, I think your use of the word global is very much on point because we are going into or may already be in a global recession. Now, that's rare. It's, it's rare when hey, China, Japan, U.S., Germany, they're all in recession at the same time. But that's what's unfolding. That's a big deal. Uh, well, for obvious reasons, uh, because, uh, you know, it affects uh, basically everyone, but, um, there's no life preserver. There's no, you know, it's not like China's going to pull us all out of it with cheap exports or, or Japan's going to, you know, put the pedal to the metal in terms of fixed, uh, asset investment, uh, you know, et cetera. So, so that's a really bad sign. I mean, and just to be very specific, you know, we just saw U.S. Fourth quarter GDP grew at a 2.9% annualized rate. People are like, yeah, that's pretty good. Um, and you know, it's not good by post 1980 standards. It's not good at all by post World War II standards, but post 2008, yeah, that's not, that's not bad. Uh, again, you have to disaggregate it and you look at what grew. It was uh, inventories were a big contributor, uh, and net exports were a big contributor. Um, and a fi- fixed asset investment in particular, there was a big, load of um, uh, aircraft orders for Boeing, which is notoriously lumpy. You know, they, they'll have a big month, blowout month, and then nothing for a couple of months, not nothing, but, you know, s- something very low. So when you look at that, uh, inventories are counted as part of GDP, of course, but it's not necessarily a good thing. If inventories are piling up, it means retailers are not buying. And this kind of goes back to the whole supply chain breakdown of a year ago. That's what my book sold out was about. So you go back to, uh, let's say, the spring of 2022. The supply chain had completely fallen apart. And if you were a purchasing manager and you were, you were saying to yourself, um, okay, we're kind of coming out of COVID. We're, we're, we're going to start growing. Uh, but the supply chain is broken. So instead of ordering one, you know, container, I'm going to order three containers because maybe one will get through, you know, through the bottlenecks. I only want one, but I'm going to order three and hope for the best. What happened was some of that, a lot of the stuff was alleviated, not for good reasons, not really for logistical reasons, but because the consumers slowed down a lot beginning in June, partly in reaction to the Fed starting to hike rates in March of uh, 2022. Uh, and then here come the three containers. So at this, at the, at the exact moment when uh, demand destruction is kicking in, your inventory is going to the rafters. So what do retailers do or wholesalers for that matter? But retail, they slash prices that, you know, two for one sales, uh, you know, because inventories are a nightmare for retailers for obvious reasons. Number one, you have to finance them. So they eat up working capital. It could be cash, but now you know, you got a bunch of stuff in the back office. And number two, it just takes up space. I mean, it, it insurance costs and, and other costs like that. But the other thing people kind of underestimate is that like st- uh, fashion goes, stuff goes out of fashion. You know, ne- last spring's styles are not next spring styles. You still got last spring stuff. Good luck. You know, it's, it, we're getting close to spring. So you're dumping that stuff. Um, you know, consumer electronics, uh, you know, you got an iPhone 13 Well, everybody wants an iPhone 14, you know, whatever. I mean, you take the point. So, um, so piling up inventories is a very unhealthy sign. It means the retail sector is drying up, demand destruction is kicking in, costs are going up because you got to finance all this stuff and your profit margins are going down. So I don't take a lot of comfort from that. But the other thing, to the extent you can disaggregate monthly data, and there's a lot of monthly data, yeah, 2.9% annualized for the quarter, but it really slowed down in December. Christmas was a disaster. I mean, yeah, people bought stuff for Christmas, but way below expectations. And again, it goes back to piling up the inventory at the worst possible time. So it looks like the U.S. is going into 2023. Possibly recession started in December. If not, we expect it to start soon. But you're seeing the same thing in Europe now. Europe got a break with the weather. Uh, you know, obviously there's a war going on, so that's a big factor. But, um, uh, you know, and natural gas prices, uh, skyrocketed and, uh, and, and oil prices skyrocketed, um, again in mid, uh, 2022. They've come down, but it doesn't mean that, you know, all is well or, or they're out of the woods and there are, there are other things going on. China is a basket case. Um, you know, they went from zero COVID. It was bad public policy and bad health policy. But they did it anyway. So they flipped almost on a dime. So they just turned on a dime and said, okay, let it rip. The, the positive letter, okay, let everyone get infected and we'll do the best we can. One of the ways you get through it is by letting it rip and you develop what's called herd immunity. And that's what worked in North America and Europe. 
But the other difference with, between China and Europe and, and the U.S. is that they don't have the healthcare system to deal with it. Our healthcare system, which is pretty good, was strained. Same thing in Europe. China has nowhere near the ICU unit, the ICU units, the oxygen, the treatments, uh, the just the, the professionals, the nurses and doctors. Not even close. And when you get out to the village level, which is where most of the people still live, believe it or not, um, they uh, they often have nothing. But that is hurting the economy as much as the zero COVID. They're, they're, they had no good ways out. I'm not saying one's better than the other. They're both awful. But uh, but you still have a lot of things that are not COVID. The real estate collapse, the excessive debt, the demographic decline, um, just the impact of top-down management when you can't possibly get everything right, you know. And so and decoupling from the U.S. and the U.S. cutting off, um, you know, high tech exports to China, including third country exports where they're relying on U.S. licenses or equipment. So China's in a deep hole, probably in a recession. Japan, same thing. So, so the global economy is in bad shape. Uh, it's going into a recession. Now, a lot of people have said that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to have a recession as if it's no big deal, but they're expecting a mild recession. I see a much more severe recession. Now, the other half, what does this mean for financial markets? And there, um, the best way I've been able to explain it, imagine you're in a, an, an Irish pub. And you got three Irish storytellers and I'm part Irish, so I can talk about the Irish, you know, and, and, uh, um, but they're telling three different stories and you got to listen to each one. So there's the Fed story, the market story, and then there's something called reality. What's actually happening. Uh, so stock market's telling us Goldilocks, bond market's telling us, you know, here comes, uh, you know, Hurricane Mitch or whatever. And then, uh, there's what I call the reality. Uh, and I guess I'm a storyteller here, but, um, what I see is is a kind of a hybrid. The Fed's doing what they're doing, right or wrong. Okay, they're they're doing what they're doing. The market has their own interpretation. I agree with the market, certainly the bond market, that the Fed has probably over tightened. They probably are at the um, so called terminal rate. They just don't know it. They're going to keep going for the reasons I explained. That means they're going to make it worse. They're going to make the recession even worse. Um, and they may pivot, uh, to say that there could be a rate cut. Um, it won't be in April, but you know, rate cut in August, maybe I wouldn't rule that out, but for a really bad reason. In other words, if the Fed cuts rates, which they may, the pivot may be real. It's not because they engineered a soft landing and Goldilocks and everything. Oh, that's just right. It's because they screwed up as usual as they've been doing since 1913. They over tightened and they found out too late. And then they got to, then they have to slam on the brakes if, or take the foot off the brake, if you will, in terms of rate hikes and then pivot. And we've seen this movie before. This is exactly what happened in 2018. The stock market dropped 20%. I mean, it was like 19.9 or something on the Dow. So maybe not technically a bear market, but yeah, what's the difference? It dropped 20%. The Fed was tightening into that collapse. The Fed tightened. On uh, December 16th, 2018, only like eight days before the Christmas Eve massacre and after most of the 20% collapse had already happened, they tightened one last time. So what it shows you is that when the Fed's on a mission, they, they actually don't care about the stock market, this whole, you know, Bernanke put and Greenspan put and all that. That's not how it works. Uh, they don't care that much about the. I'd rather be the U.S. than China. China's in even worse shape for different reasons. Um, it's not so much interest rate policy, although they're, they're subject to global interest rate policy and exchange rates coming from the Fed. But, uh, you can see it in real estate. It's a full scale collapse. Uh, they're, they're propping it up, but, um, the, the, the buyers aren't interested. In other words, the, the Chinese government is telling the banks to lend money to real estate developers who can't finish housing. Well, that sounds good. It's like, okay, here's some money, finish the housing. But the buyers are not flocking in. The buyers have been burned. They're shying away from that asset class. They want to increase cash. They're looking at other asset classes. They don't have a lot of choices because China has very strict capital controls. They're trying to get their money out by means legal and illegal. Uh, they're buying gold when they can. Um, but uh, as I say, they may not have a lot of choices, but even money in the bank looks pretty good compared to what's going on in real estate. The problem is too big. The bubble is too large. It's gone on for too long. We don't hear about it the same way we did about the Japanese real estate bubble in 1989, 1990. That was an epic crash. Uh, Japan is still not recovered. I remember in the 90s, early 2000s, they talked about the lost decade. Well, 
try three lost decades. That's going into a fourth. Uh, that's Japan, you know, eight or I've lost count, I should eight or nine recessions since 1989, but it's really just one long depression. That's the way to understand the Japanese economy. China's going into something like that. We don't hear much about it because they're not transparent. They lie about their numbers. You, you need to look at private sources and other use other, other analytic tools to understand what's going on there. Uh, but they've got um, you know, drops in consumption, industrial output, real estate's collapsing. Uh, their price indices are collapsing. All this infl- fear of inflation. It's been around. It's real, but it's now turning around very quickly. And you can see that in China. China's gone through something that the world has never seen. Uh, it is a, they're going to lose 600 million people in the next 50 to 70 years. This is a demographic implosion. This is worse than the Black Death. Of course, the Black Death, uh, killed somewhere between a third and half the population of Europe in the uh, 14th century. Um, uh, it was a good time for, uh, for labor, by the way, uh, the, you know, the labor was so scarce that returns to labor went up versus returns to capital, uh, because there weren't enough workers. Uh, but that's the only thing, uh, that can come close. Even the, uh, you know, the Spanish flu of 1919 killed about no, no one's certain of the number, but, but between 100 million and maybe over 200 million people. The 30 years war was certainly, you know, in the early 17th century was certainly, Highly destructive, but what's going on in China now is is worse than any of those things. Um, you know, it has to do with math, you know, simple demographic math. Uh, the key number is two point one. Two people have to produce two point one children. You know, man and woman, or you can say per woman if you if you want, uh, have to produce two point one children to keep the population constant. Why not two? Why not two producing two? The answer is infant mortality and those who don't make it to uh, adulthood and can continue the uh, repopulation of the planet, uh, if you will. But they're not even close to that. They're well below two. And by the way, so is, so is the rest of the world. So is Australia and the US and Western Europe and a lot of other places. This is a global phenomenon, but it's particularly acute in China. Maybe the case that China's, uh, replacement rate is, uh, or, or birth rate is actually one. Uh, it has to be 2.1 to maintain. It could be one or lower. Uh, this is a, a demographic implosion, unlike anything ever seen, uh, anyone's ever seen. It also has a dynamic. You can't reverse it very quickly. It, it feeds on itself as I was talking about inflation earlier. So, uh, this is going to continue for 50 to 75 years. Uh, they're going to lose 600 million people. There are a lot of definitions of GDP, a four or five part definition. They're more complex calculations, but there's one really simple definition that only has two factors, population and productivity. How many people are working and how productive are they? That's nominal GDP. It's, that's one definition of gross GDP, uh, or, or nominal uh, GDP. Well, if your population is dropping from 1.4 billion to 800 million, you're losing 600 million people. Uh, and then what about productivity? Well, the other thing that's going on is China's population is aging very quickly. So you get a population set people in the seventies, eighties and nineties, uh, with very large amounts of, um, cognitive decline, dementia. Uh, obviously there's no productivity there, but it's worse than that because then you look at the shrinking population between the ages of 25 and 54. It's called their prime working age. More and more of those people are going to have to be involved in elder care. They're going to have to be basically caretakers or caregivers for the older population I described. A very worthy job, but not one that lends itself to productivity gains. Um, bathing hasn't changed in about 5,000 years. Robots don't do best. Um, the only real innovation in bathing in uh, between 1870 and 1940, we did see the rise of indoor plumbing and hot water. That's good. Um, I, I enjoy both, but, um, but that's it. We, I can't think of any other bathing innovations, uh, in, in the last several millennia. So if you have a shrinking working age population, a rising older population, high degree of cognitive decline and a big slice of the working age population having to provide elder care or be caregivers for the older population. Tell me where your industrial output's coming from. Tell me where your productivity is coming from. And, uh, Sorry if I mentioned this already, but 50% of the water in China is poisoned uh, because of, you know, just their industrial practices. You know, they, they, uh, if you're a gold miner in Australia, I've invested in gold mines around the world. I know that places like Canada, the U.S. and uh, Australia, if you use cyanide to leach the gold, and that's a very common technique, you have to account for every, you know, microgram. You, you know, whatever you put in, you got to take out, weigh it. 
dispose of it properly. In China, they just dump it into the rivers, and so the rivers are poison. Um, so China is uh, uh, an economic, demographic, industrial, moral, religious uh, wasteland, and uh, will suffer. It's it's already in a recession. Just to, just to cut to the chase, again, they lie about their statistics. So so here you have the two largest economies in the world, U.S. and China. U.S. is slowly going into what I expect will be a severe recession. China is in a century-long decline, uh, unlike one that the world has ever seen. Um, that could eventually lead to social unrest and a regime change, but let's not count on that in the short run. Just expect China to um, to shrink and become more autarkic, decoupled from the Western world, and uh, certainly not be a, a source of growth. Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, the largest and most sophisticated semiconductor manufacturing in the world. And semiconductors are in everything. It's not just computers. There are 1,400 semiconductors in an automobile. Uh, there's a semiconductor or more in your, your dishwasher, your refrigerator, your washing machine. They're everywhere. Internet of things. We all understand that. Um, so TSMC, based in Taiwan. Uh, the United States has a military doctrine called the broken nest theory. And what it says is that if China, well, it comes from a Chinese proverb, ironically, and it says, if the nest is broken, how can the eggs survive? Um, and what it means is that if China invades Taiwan, and I'm not forecasting an invasion, could happen though, um, we or the Taiwanese will very quickly destroy all the semiconductor manufacturers in Taiwan. We'll just blow them up. And China won't get anything. They'll have the broken nest. Taiwan Semiconductor knows this. Um, they talked to the U.S. intelligence and military. I spent a lot of time on the Fed. And the question is, okay, what about June? They got, you know, six more meetings this year. So here's the Fed's dilemma, and it, it's playing out in real time. So Jay Powell gave, I lost count, seven or eight speeches, and they said the same thing every time. He said, inflation is job one. We're on a path to raise interest rates. We're not going to quit until inflation is under control. Now, there's a little wiggle room around that. Their target is two. They actually look at personal consumption expenditure year over year, core. That's their metric. There are 15 ways to measure inflation, but that's the one they like. But even that is still over close to five. It's a long way from two. That's the point. You're trying to get to two. They're a long way from two. But there's something called the terminal rate. What's the terminal rate? Well, no one knows the number. I don't know because Jay Powell doesn't know. So we're all estimating. But um, the terminal rate, it's a rate that's high enough to bring down inflation on its own without further rate hikes. Knows we can stop here and confident that inflation is going to come down without doing more. Because the conundrum is, okay, they've been raising rates since March 2022. Monetary policy works with a lag. Inflation peaked in July 2022, and it has been coming down ever since. You know, some of the some months were, you know, January was hot compared to December, but the trend has been down. So they're raising rates and inflation is coming down. So that's good. But here's what they don't know. Was inflation coming down because they were raising rates or had they already hit the terminal rate and they just didn't know it? Because Wall Street was like, no, you've hit the terminal rate. Stop, please stop. You got this under control. The Fed doesn't believe that. One of the greatest blunders in monetary policy was Paul Volcker in 1980, who had started raising rates in 1979 and inflation was coming down. But then in 1980, we had a very sharp recession that had nothing to do with monetary policy. It wasn't caused by Paul Volcker. Jimmy Carter put a cap on credit card interest and everyone Banks stopped issuing credit cards. Well, that'll that'll sink the economy. And then so Volcker reacted to that by lowering interest rates seven percentage points, not 70 basis points, seven percentage points, because we're in a recession, right? That's what Feds do, the Fed chairs do. But because it was a regulatory blunder, they fixed it and the economy came roaring back. And then inflation really took off worse than when Volcker got in in 79, early 1980. So Volcker had to take rates to 20% to get inflation under control the second time after cutting them in 1980. And that's called the Volcker mistake or the Volcker blunder. And Volcker himself, I spoke to him, he said, yeah, that was, that was a mistake that I should have stuck. I should have stuck to my program, not worried about the economy and unemployment, but just got inflation under control. But when he threw in the towel prematurely, the inflation went to the moon. Jay Powell doesn't want to be that guy. Jay Powell knows that episode as well as I do. And he doesn't want to be the guy who throws in the towel early and then inflation just goes to the moon and then he's got it. Then he has to take interest rates to 15% or something ridiculous. So Wall Street's saying, you're already there, mission accomplished. Powell's saying, not so fast. They told Volcker that and he cut rates and it was an enormous mistake. So Powell's not going to be that guy. 
So what is the terminal rate today? I would say five and a half because we had we had a lot of hot data, you know, unemployment down, uh, job creation up, retail sales up, not to the moon, but these are the opposite of what Powell is looking for. So he's had no confirmation that inflation is coming down on his own. He's had a lot of data that says inflation may be getting ready to take off again. So you got to say the terminal rate went from five and a quarter to five and a half, maybe more. Let's you know see what he does in June. And Powell always said, I don't care if there's a recession. I don't care if there's unemployment because the long-term costs of inflation are going to be much greater than those short-term problems. We got to suffer through that to get a bigger problem under control. He thinks of inflation. He said this many, many times. Now, along comes Silicon Valley Bank. Okay. Oh, by the way, in addition to raising rates, don't forget QT, quantitative tightening. They were shrinking their balance sheet. It's very hard to estimate the monetary impact of shrinking the balance sheet, but the best estimate is for every trillion dollars you take it down, it's probably equal to a one percentage point hike in the Fed funds rate. So the tightening has been more than just taking the Fed funds rate up. You also have to take into account QT. Now let's go back to the, the bond, the bond guarantee and bailing out the entire banking system. The Fed proceeded to guarantee every deposit and every bank in the entire U.S. banking system. Here we're talking, you know, six or seven trillion dollars of assets. And the way they did it was um, a lot of other banks, you know, big ones and small ones, at least the big ones that had good risk management, but a lot of small and medium-sized banks, they had the same problem Silicon Valley Bank had. Maybe the depositors weren't work, walking out the door, or maybe they weren't funding tech startups, but they had underwater bonds and overnight deposits and were facing the same thing. So the Fed said, Okay, all your banks, if you send us your bonds, we'll give you cash. Okay, that's just a normal discount operation, but they will give you cash equivalent to the par value. So again, remember the market value is like 80 cents on the dollar, but the Fed says we'll give you 100 cents on the dollar. So now you ship your bonds to the Fed, they give you not 100%, which is like low collateral, but they give you 120%. So the banks are shipping in bonds that are worth 80 cents on the dollar. Why wouldn't you do that? I'm like, hey, hey, Fed, if you want to give me a low, low interest rate bridge loan uh, with 80% down, I'll take all you got. So now the banks are going to are going to do that. And by the way, there's no because it's structured kind of like a repurchase agreement. There's no sale. So they don't have to market to market. If you sold it to a third party, a dealer, you would. You'd have to take the loss. But now they don't have to take the loss. So they're shipping in billions, potentially a trillion dollars or more of these bonds. They're not getting 80, 90 cents on the dollar, which is what they're worth. They're getting 100 cents on the dollar, which was the original purchase price. They don't have to take the loss and they're getting cash. Why wouldn't you do that all day long? So in effect, they bailed out the entire banking system to the tune of trillions of dollars. They've just blew up the $250,000 limit. Forget that. I mean, I know what the statute says, but they threw that out the window. And uh, the, the moral hazard, the economic consequences, the repercussions of this are kind of unimaginable. I mean, I can sketch them. I can talk about them. You know, to hear Janet Yellen say it's not a bailout. Are you kidding me? This is the biggest bailout in history. And I, you know, I, I negotiated the LTCM bailout. I, I lived through that. That was a trillion dollars of derivatives. Uh, and through 2008, 2020, the pandemic, I go back to 1994, the Mexican tequila crisis. I've, I've lived through all these and been more or less directly involved in all of them. And this is orders of magnitude greater in terms of what's being bailed out. Doesn't that mean that a lot of banks will be sending the bonds to the Fed and getting cash? Yes, yeah, exactly what it means. Well, where's the cash come from? You got to print it. So on the one hand, we're doing quantitative tightening by letting bonds mature and not reinvesting. But on the other hand, you just send an open invitation, open party, house party to every bank in the country saying, send us your bonds and we'll give you cash. Not only that, but 100 cents on the dollar, even if they're worth 80. So, so you're going to have potentially trillions of dollars of new money being printed at a time when the Fed's trying to get inflation under control and they were trying to shrink the balance sheet. They're going to be expanding the balance sheet. So, I mean, there's no way out. There's no good way out of this. You can pause. Uh, I don't think they will, but you could pause and not raise rates, right? And implicitly saying we're not going to raise rates for the foreseeable future because we got all these losses in the banks. Okay, inflation goes to the moon. I promise you it'll just take off like a rocket. Or you can raise interest rates 25 basis points and we'll continue this war on inflation, but you're just going to increase the bond losses in the banks and make them send you more bonds and get more cash. Or the third thing is just take away the, the umbrella and let all these banks fail. 
I mean, it's like name your poison, name your poison. You can have runaway inflation, severe acute banking crisis, or basically a lot more, as I say, a lot more bank failures uh, and, and a severe recession because you're going to keep raising rates. There are three choices, but none of them are good. Inflation is coming down, by the way. And uh, having said that, the target is 2%. So he's, he's not there, but he's making progress. Now, Wall Street's saying, you're done. You, you, you did it. Mission accomplished. Inflation is coming down. You got what you want to give it time. Stop raising rates. You're going to kill the economy. But the Fed is saying, well, we actually don't know. We can't untangle it. Yes, inflation is coming down. That's objective. But is it coming down because we're still raising rates or is it coming down because we're at the terminal rate? Those are two different things. And right now, and this is what Powell's been saying, the Fed leans to the view that they're not at the terminal rate, that inflation is coming down because they're raising rates. They have not achieved the terminal rate. So my expectation is the Fed will raise interest rates 25 basis points in March. March 22nd is the Fed meeting after that. Well, that gets you to five and a quarter. And even the hawk, more hawkish members think that that's probably the terminal rate. So Powell and the Fed have said, yeah, inflation is coming down, but it's because we're raising rates, not because we're at the terminal rate. We're going to get to the terminal rate, probably two more hikes, and then we'll pause. And then if we're right, we'll just let inflation come down on its own. And that may take a year. So all this stuff about the Fed pivot and cutting rates and all that stuff, I mean, the Fed's thinking mid-2024 before they do that. Now, Wall Street, and I'll say markets, not just Wall Street, but the big money in places like uh, the euro dollar futures curve and, and the U.S. Treasury curve, which are highly inverted, are saying, no, you're not going to get that far. You may be at the terminal rate already. You're definitely cause, going to cause a recession. It'll be more severe than you think. Uh, and rates are going to have to come down uh, sooner than people expect. In other words, you've already achieved the terminal rate. You just don't know it. And you'll probably be the last to know. So with Wall Street... With the cheerleaders, you know, sending that message, but with some serious market indicators, including yield curves, sending that message. Why is Powell sticking to the game plan as I described it? And the answer goes back to 1980, believe it or not, and what's called the Volcker mistake. And everyone knows, you know, Volcker became Fed chairman in 1979. He, he stayed on until the um, early to mid 80s. Uh, and he did raise interest rates to 20% or very close to it to kill inflation, which went up to 15% uh, at the time. But people forget that there was a recession in 1980. It was sharp, but quick. It was over very quickly. It had nothing to do with monetary policy. The Carter administration issued some dopey regulation on a ceiling on credit card interest rates. And the industry said, fine, we're just not going to lend anybody any money. The economy fell instantly, kind of like a smaller version of what happened in 2020 with the, with the uh, pandemic panic. Uh, and then they said, oh, sorry, just kidding. And then, and then uh, they took the ceiling off and then things got back to normal. Now, this was a time when farmers around the country were driving front loaders and tractors to Washington and they were circling the Fed building. And one guy drove his tractor up the steps of the Fed and Volcker was being burned in effigy. That I mean, that all happened. So uh, it was a little bit of pressure. And of course, Congress was up in arms and the White House was up in arms. So Volcker, uh, not quite panicked, but he cut interest rates seven percentage points, not 0.7, seven full percentage points to deal with the recession, which, number one, was unnecessary because the recession was caused by a policy blunder from the White House, which was quickly corrected. And number two, he had not won the fight against inflation. Well, after he cut rates and we came out of that very quick sort of snap recession, inflation got even worse. And that's when Volcker had to raise rates to 20%. And Volcker, in hindsight, he said, we, we shouldn't have done that. We should have stuck to our inflation mission. So now Powell, remember, Powell's not an economist. He's a lawyer. So he kind of thinks like a lawyer. I can relate to that, you know, looking at both sides. Powell does not want to be that guy. He does not want to be the guy who balks early and cuts rates, the famous Wall Street pivot, before the battle against inflation is won. Because the outcome could be exactly what Volcker experienced, which is inflation wasn't done, doesn't go away, comes back stronger, and then you do have to destroy the economy, as we did in 1981-82. That was the worst recession. That was far worse than the little one in 1980. That was the worst since the Great Depression. We've managed to break that record several times since then, but at the time that was horrific. But Volcker and others have said that was a blunder he never should have done. So Powell does not want to give up the rate hikes too early because he does not want to repeat the Volcker mistake. He does not want to be that guy. And that's what's driving him, even as Wall Street screams, you're already there. 
So, so the question is, how does this play out? In my view, Powell probably is there. He probably is at something like a terminal rate. He probably doesn't have to raise interest rates anymore. He doesn't believe that himself. His models tell him otherwise because they're relying on the Phillips curve, which is junk science. I mean, the last time I looked at a Phillips curve, it was flat. At least where I went to school, curve was curved. This, this thing is flat. There is no correlation between unemployment and inflation. There just isn't, but the Fed thinks there is. So I always tell people, if you want to forecast Fed policy and understand the Fed, don't think like a rational person. You have to think like the Fed. You have to get inside their heads or else you're going to get it wrong. So they're looking at unemployment, which is the lowest. The unemployment rate is the lowest since 1969. Well, if you believe in the Phillips curve, then that's a sure sign of inflation. You know, as I say, even though it's coming down, it's still pretty high. They think they have to keep fighting this fight. But here's what they're missing. Here's where it all falls down. Yeah, inflation as measured, CPI, PPI, you know, uh, personal consumption expenditure, core, non-core, year over year. There are like 20 different ways to measure it. Uh, it is it is coming down, but there are two sources of inflation. And it's going to sound obvious, but you got to separate them, the supply side and the demand side. Both result in price increases, but they have completely different dynamics. Supply side inflation is what we're seeing. It's what we saw in 1974 with the Arab oil embargo during the Arab-Israeli war when they cut us off from oil. And, you know, you had to line up for gasoline. I lived through that. Now, and again, this is what my book Sold Out is about, the breakdown of the supply chain, partly related to energy, partly related to the war in Ukraine, partly related to the pandemic panic. Uh, as I explained in the book, it actually predates that. The breakdown started in 2018 with Trump's trade war. And then... COVID made it worse, yes. Ukrainian war made it worse, yes. But it, it really started before that. So, of course, prices went up and people were trying to pay whatever they had to to get what they needed. And energy prices were a big driver of that. So that feeds through as a form of inflation. The other kind of inflation is from the demand side. So the supply side is called cost push. Costs go up and they push it onto the consumers. The other kind is from the demand side. It's called demand pull. And basically, consumers have a change in mentality. They're worried about inflation. They would say, hey, you know, I was thinking about buying a refrigerator. Gee, I better go buy it today because if I wait for six months, the price is going to go up uh, or apply that to anything, a new dress, new suit of clothes, whatever. And so you're pulling demand forward and it's behavioral. And that will also drive prices up. But they're very different things. Now, cost push can morph into demand pull. That's what happened in the 70s. It started from the supply side, but by the late 70s, 80s, and Volcker, which we've just been talking about, it had tipped over into the demand side. That hasn't happened yet. We've had the supply side inflation, the cost push. It hasn't yet tipped into demand pull. It hasn't really affected consumer behavior that much in terms of uh, people anticipating more inflation. It could, but it hasn't happened yet. But here's why that's an important distinction. Cost push inflation negates itself. You know, the old saying that the cure for high oil prices is high oil prices. So it tends to negate itself, whereas demand pull feeds on itself. Powell has not made that distinction. And if I'm right, and I think I am right, and the evidence backs that up, this inflation will come down, not because the Fed is raising interest rates, but because higher prices destroy demand all on their own. So it, it does tend to depress um, demand, destroy demand and hurt the economy. Russia had about 600 tons of gold, and today they have 2,300 tons. China had about 600 tons of gold, and today they have about 2,000 tons, just slightly less, that we know of. And they may have several thousand tons off the books in the state administration of foreign exchange that we don't know about because that's the, the, that's completely opaque. So Russia and China did exactly what we warned the Pentagon about in 2009, exactly, which is increase their gold reserves by a factor of four or more. When you talk about reserve currency, you have to understand what that means. It's not like the People's Bank of China has a bunch of $100 bills on pallets stacked up in the basement. When people say reserve currency, what they really mean is the currency of the bonds that they invest in. In other words, they're dollar-denominated assets in the form of treasury bonds or notes. That's what China actually has on their books, um, not like the dollars per se. What I was hypothesizing then, and I would I'd come back to this, is you can create a brand new currency that does have all that stuff. And in my example, they, they use a Swiss bank, um, UK law, uh, put the gold in a third party depository. If you wanted some of the new currency, you could deposit your own gold and get some of the currency or trade with them or run a surplus. So it was a, it was a replacement system, but it, but you, you would need the gold to, to instill confidence. Um, but uh, 
they don't they, again they don't have bond markets so they're not going to have them soon so those the yuan and the ruble aren't going to replace anything well the repercussions may be felt for 10 years or longer uh, but the the, uh, the immediate impact is going to go well beyond um, uh, you know the so-called sanctions what the point I was really making was we're slapping sanctions on Russia Russia is hitting back with some retaliatory actions uh, and it's pretty easy to, to look at the direct impact of that but there's second order and third order effects that will pop up all over the world and could very quickly get out of control and think of it as the economic equivalent of a nuclear war nobody wants a nuclear war uh, but the, they, the, the one thing they all said in common the one thing they all shared was don't go there and what they meant was that Nobody wakes up and says, oh, gee, I think I'll start a nuclear war today. What a good idea. That that never happens. What does happen is you get into an escalatory situation, back and forth and back and forth, where you're escalating and escalating, and you end up in a nuclear war. You never intended it, never started out that way, but you end up there through escalation. Now, take that, and that, that, that is good analysis. So take that and apply it to what is now, I would say, the first full-scale economic war uh sanctions war we've had sanctions you know for a long time and we go back to the at least the 70s with with iran but even before that i mean fdr put sanctions on japan nothing on this scale this is uh, unprecedented in its scope and application uh and my only point is it, it the effects of this are going to not just last a long time yes but they're going to pop up in very very unexpected places um I, I did. It, uh, let me make the, let me make the point. This was uh, there was never a war that was easier to prevent. There was, there's never been a war that's easier to prevent, and there's never been a war that's easier to end. Uh, the, you could end this war in 48 hours or less. Uh, having said that, I did expect that through a series of policy blunders and escalation, in this case, military escalation and political escalation, and then later in the book, around on page 250 or so, I have a whole section on Ukraine, Russia, and natural gas. So this has been brewing for a long time. Um, you can go back to the 2008 Bucharest Declaration, but if you, if you want to pick one thing and say, hey, when, when did this thing take a turn for the worse right. so that we were on a path to war? That was the color revolution sponsored by Obama and Biden, um, which was a coup d'etat. I mean, the, the president of Ukraine at the time, he was pro-Russian, and Obama set out to depose him, and they did. And they put in Poroshenko, who was a U.S. puppet, and at the same time, like a month, well, two months after the color revolution, one month before Poroshenko, uh, Putin took Crimea. He said, okay, that's how you want to play, fine. Uh, you, throw, you move away from neutrality, move towards NATO, NATO, I'll take Crimea, your move. And then there was nothing, to, Putin didn't take one square inch during the Trump administration, because Trump is, Trump is highly unpredictable, but put Biden back in, who was part of the original Obama-Biden team. and so. Not only was Trump not in Putin's pocket, uh, he was the only one who stood up to Putin in such a way that Putin didn't take one square inch of territory. He took Crimea under Obama. Now he's taking kind of half the country under Biden. Didn't take anything under Trump. So that completely debunks that. But just to take it one step further, who is in the pocket of, um, of, the, of the Ukrainians, at least? And the answer is Joe Biden, because of Hunter Biden, who made millions of dollars from Burisma, the large natural gas company. Ukraine is ranked uh, in the low 90s of the of the most corrupt countries in the world. In other words, the it's at the bottom on a corruption list with the best with the, with the most honest countries being on top. Um, Ukraine is very close to the bottom. It's it's the most corrupt country in Europe, one of the most corrupt countries in the world. Zelensky is just another oligarch, just another phony. Uh, now you can take sides, but to me, Putin's a dictator. Zelensky is a dictator. You know, pick your dictator. But um, this idea that he's some, you know, good guy Democrat is nonsense. Well, it's a phone call, basically. I mean, Biden, uh, Biden's kind of non compass mentis, but somebody with uh, who can, you know, string a few sentences together needs to call Zelensky and say, um, here's what we're going to do. You, you're not going to join NATO. Well, we'll get the, the NATO Secretary General, John, John Stoltenberg, uh, to say that. You need to say it. The U.S. will say it. So you're not going to join NATO. You're not going to join the EU. You can be independent in the sense of being autonomous, but you have to be neutral. When, when you've got two great powers, whether it's the U.S. and Russia or um, the U.S. plus Europe and Russia confronting each other, uh, the idea of buffer states, I mean, that's as old as, uh, you know, if, if not history, uh, at least the, the history of buffer states is uh, several centuries old at this point. It's, it's a part of 
what every international uh, strategist uh, looks at. So Ukraine should be a buffer state. It should be neutral. Uh, that way Putin has no reason to invade and we have no reason to try to push the borders of NATO to a point slightly east of Moscow, which uh, Moscow hasn't been attacked from the east since Genghis Khan. These sanctions will not work to stop the war or slow the war or change the outcome of the war. Now, they absolutely punish the Russian economy. Yep. They punish Russian individuals, consumers, Russian citizens. They're going to have fewer options, uh, more expensive goods. Um, you know, their economy is going to slow down. Unemployment will go up. The ruble is devalued. All those things are true. But they're also true in the United States. We're going to punish Americans far worse than the Russians. Uh, we're already seeing, I took a long trip yesterday. Uh, I filled up my car with gas at the end of the trip. It was $76. Inflation's here. Uh, we all see it. Uh, you know, price of gasoline, uh, eggs, milk, butter, groceries at the store, um, rents, electricity, uh, home heating, uh, you know, fuel, uh, you name it. Across the board, inflation is affecting everything. Um, and it started uh, really in uh, mid-2021. So here we are, uh, almost 2023. So it's been going on for well over a year. Uh, for the first six or seven months, you know, Jay Powell, and for that matter, Janet Yellen were like, yeah, we see it, but it's transitory, transitory. We know that story. Finally, November 2021, Jay Powell threw in the towel, uh, said, OK, time time to retire the word transitory. Now let's get to work. And they um, started raising interest rates in uh, March 2022. And we're now up to uh, Fed funds rate of 4%. Uh, they're going to raise them again in December, uh, December 14th by another 50 basis points. We kind of, you know, still a little bit away from that but we know it's coming the fed this is the no drama fed they tell you what they're doing in advance so uh i always say you don't you don't need a crystal ball to figure out the fed you just need to listen to what they're saying and believe them so they're gonna they're gonna do 50 basis points in uh december that'll get the um uh, policy rate of the fed funds uh target rate to four and a half percent but that's from zero march 1st it was zero so to go from zero to four and a half in less than nine months, uh, about eight and a half months. That's amazing. We haven't seen anything like that since uh, uh, Paul Volcker in, in the early 80s. Now, I know rates are not 13, 14%, but, um, but to go from zero to four and a half, I can say in eight months is, uh, is a shock. Now, what's, why is the Fed doing this? Well, they, they say they want to kill inflation. Okay. But um, there are two sources of inflation. Inflation can come from the supply side um what's called cost push inflation costs go up and they get pushed into um uh, you know re retail prices and, and consumer prices uh and that is what's happening that's because of the supply chain breakdown energy uh, prices shortages of goods etc so that's cost push inflation from the supply side there's another kind of inflation that comes from the demand side and this is much more psychological it's when consumers say you know they just have it in their heads and maybe from objective data that prices are going up and so they change their behavior they say you know i was thinking of getting a new washing machine but uh, i was going to wait six months but i better buy it now because the price is going to be a lot higher in six months or a car or, you know suit of clothes a dress uh, furniture whatever it is better buy it now because the price is going to go up it's going to get worse. Inflation is here to stay. Um, commodities are going to boom. Oil prices are going to soar. Bonds are going to crash. And gold has been in a very funny situation, which is the following. Normally, you say, well, if there's inflation coming, why isn't the price of gold going to the moon? And why on earth would gold prices go up if there were deflation or disinflation? The answer is that you have to look at the yield of maturity on the 10-year treasury note. That's our benchmark security. Um, a lot of people look at LIBOR, but I'm like, no, if you're making investment decisions, you're buying a house, you're doing capital investing, these are all five, 10, sometimes 20 year decisions. The 10 year note is the right benchmark for those large long-term investments. Um, well, that's an alternative place to put money. You can buy gold, you can buy a 10 year treasury note. So what's been true since last summer is as the yield to maturity on the 10 year note goes up, it, that strengthens the dollar and gold prices have gone down because the dollar price of gold is just another cross rate, just another cross exchange rate. So a stronger dollar means a lower dollar price for gold. But if the yield of maturity in the 10 year note goes down, then that weakens the dollar and the dollar price of gold goes up because a weaker dollar means a higher dollar price for gold. So curiously, 
the price of gold is being driven not by inflation in the abstract, but by the strength of the dollar, which is reciprocal to the interest rate on the 10-year treasury notes. But here's what has changed. I talk about gold bull markets and gold bear markets, and I start my analysis in 1971, and I don't have to go through all, the, all that data, but that's, that's how I think about it. And you're like, well, Jim, why 1971? Why not before that? And of course, 1971, it was when Nixon stopped redeeming dollars for gold. Americans couldn't even own gold in 1971. It was contraband. It was like drugs or you know, machine guns or something. But foreign trading partners could redeem dollars for gold up until 1971. And then Nixon said, no more. And then that was the final decoupling. But prior to that, gold was actually money. In other words, uh, with under Bretton Woods, gold was pegged at $35 an ounce. Prior to Bretton Woods, it was pegged at $20.67 an ounce. We've gone back to the 1920s or earlier through most of the 19th century. For the United States and sterling, I think it was four seventy-five. It could be off a little bit on that, but you know, four four pounds and and change. And as late as World War One, say nineteen thirteen, if you were a Brit and you were getting on the steamer from London to, you know, at the time Bombay, today Mumbai, you took a purse of the British sovereigns. The British sovereign is it's about uh, about eight grams, a little bit less. You know, it's not an ounce; it's a quarter ounce because an ounce is almost too much. Even even today. What are you going to do with a one ounce coin that's worth, you know, almost $2,000? Uh, you know, you're not going to use that for to buy a pack of gum. But in the day, there was the quarter ounce, which today would be, you know, like a $500 bill. So it's still a significant amount of money. Uh, but you could get on the steamer in Southampton and get off in Bombay at the time. And it was money good. You could take that British sovereign and spend it anywhere. And same thing in Singapore and Hong Kong and Japan or all around the world. So gold was actually money. So it wasn't a question of, oh, what's the exchange rate? It was, the gold was the money and people thought about it by weight. They said, oh, a sovereign, that's eight grams of gold. So that's worth, you know, that'll get you whatever. So, uh, and that was true throughout history. And so it's really only since 1971, when we decoupled completely in terms of an exchange rate that you have to think about, you know, well, what's the dollar price of gold? Because it's not fixed. But okay, well, what happened to the memory? What happened to the 3,000 years I just talked about? Well, the answer is it happened in stages and it actually took, it took about 75 years. So it began in 1914. 1914 was the outbreak of World War I. Everybody needed gold. There was a, there was a run on gold um, and countries needed gold because they knew they would need gold to pay for the war to try to win the war. Whether it didn't matter if you're Germany, UK or whoever. And remember, the United States was neutral. The United States did not get in the war until 1917, the war started in 1914. So for those first two and a half years, New York was a money center to all of Europe, to, to all the belligerents. Uh, so everyone scrambled for gold. So if you were a citizen, they asked you to bring your gold to the bank and they gave you paper money. And but people did it out of a patriotic, it's existential. War is not a normal market. You're gonna, if you lose the war, you got bigger problems than your gold. And so people put the gold in the banks. What did the banks do? They melted it down and made 400 ounce bars. And they said, don't worry, your money's backed by the gold, but keep using that paper money, uh, but it's redeemable for gold. But oh, by the way, they're 400 ounce bars. Nobody walks around with a 400 ounce bar in her purse. I'm sure you've seen one and I have as well. They're, they're heavy, they weigh about 35 pounds. You don't walk around with them. So all of a sudden the, the gold was still there and the paper money was backed by gold in theory, but the gold had disappeared into the banks. That's step one. Step two, and this happened in the 1930s, the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks. So first, the commercial banks took the gold from the people. Then the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks. And the Federal Reserve System sold all the banks. Hey, send your, send your gold to the regional Federal Reserve Bank. And of course, most of it went to the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. So now it's not even in the banks anymore, right? But you're still walking around thinking your paper money is somehow attached to gold. But people haven't seen gold for a while, uh, unless you're a collector. Step three... Uh, the United States Treasury and the finance ministries took it from the central bank. The 1934, the United, the United States Treasury seized the gold of the Federal Reserve System. Bearing in mind, the Federal Reserve System is privately owned. And they gave them a gold certificate. And you go to the Federal Reserve System website today and, you know, hunt around a little bit on the links and find the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. And it's there. And look on the, look in the assets and the first line item is gold certificate, and it's valued at $11 billion. But that's because they value the gold at $42 an ounce. If you, and I've revalued it, the answer is that today's market, that that $11 billion is actually worth $470 billion. 
So the Fed has a hidden asset of 450 odd billion that's not on the balance sheet represented by a gold certificate. But it's not the gold. The Treasury has the gold. And by the way, where do we keep our gold? I'm talking about the United States. The Treasury owns the gold. The Fed has a paper certificate. The gold is on two army bases, West Point and Fort Knox. So I would say the army has the gold. Gold has gone from citizens walking around having it in, in your purse to commercial banks, to central banks, to finance ministries held on an army base. It's still there. The gold didn't disappear, um, but nobody talks about it. And everyone pretends it's not money, but of course it's money. Um, but but meanwhile, what's happened to this, the, the civilian population, the citizens? We stopped talking about it. We stopped saying it. We stopped learning about it. I remind people, I, I just showing my age, but my I got a graduate degree in international economics and I was class of 74. But that was the year the IMF demonetized gold. But I was the last class that was taught gold in an academic setting as a monetary asset. Uh, if you know if you're younger than I am and you know anything about gold, you're either self-taught or you went to mining college because they just stopped teaching it. So now we have two generations of scholars who never learned a thing about gold. So they they hit it, they took it, they buried it, they stopped teaching it, they stopped talking about it, and they pretended it's not there. Meanwhile, it is there. And Russia is a good example of someone who takes it seriously. In the U.S., we still have our 8,000 tons, 8,133 tons. We haven't given it away. We haven't sold any gold since 1980, by the way. We got the British to do it. We got everyone else to do our dirty work. The British sold more than half. No, seriously, the British sold more than half their gold. The Swiss sold 1,000 tons. The IMF sold uh, 400 tons in 2010. That was the last significant sell by a, a, you know, a monetary institution. Uh, Australia sold most of theirs. Canada sold most of theirs. Uh, if I were one of these other countries, I would say to the U.S., hey, why don't you sell some of your gold? But the U.S. doesn't. We haven't sold it now since 1980. Inflation is coming down, by the way. And uh, having said that, the target is 2%. So he's, he's not there, but he's making progress. Now, Wall Street's saying... You're done. You, you, you did it. Mission accomplished. Inflation is coming down. You got what you want to give it time. Stop raising rates. You're going to kill the economy. But the Fed is saying, well, we actually don't know. We can't untangle it. Yes, inflation is coming down. That's subjective. But is it coming down because we're still raising rates or is it coming down because we're at the terminal rate? Those are two different things. And right now, and this is what Powell's been saying, the Fed leans to the view that they're not at the terminal rate, that inflation is coming down because they're raising rates. They have not achieved the terminal rate. So Powell and the Fed have said, yeah, inflation is coming down, but it's because we're raising rates, not because we're at the terminal rate. We're going to get to the terminal rate and then we'll pause. And then if we're right, we'll just let inflation come down on its own. And that may take a year. So all this stuff about the Fed pivot and cutting rates and all that stuff. I mean, the Fed's thinking mid 2024 before they do that. Now, Wall Street and I'll say markets, not just Wall Street, but the big money in places like uh, the euro dollar futures curve and, and the U.S. Treasury curve, which are highly inverted, are saying, no, you're not going to get that far. You may be at the terminal rate already. You're definitely cause going to cause a recession. It'll be more severe than you think. Uh, and rates are going to have to come down uh, sooner than people expect. In other words, you've already achieved the terminal rate. You just don't know it. And you'll probably be the last to know. So with Wall Street, with the cheerleaders, you know, sending that message, but with some serious market indicators, including yield curves, sending that message. Why is Powell sticking to the game plan as I described it? And the answer goes back to 1980, believe it or not, and what's called the Volcker mistake. And everyone knows, you know, Volcker became Fed chairman in 1979. He, he stayed on until the um, early to mid 80s. Uh, and he did raise interest rates to 20 percent or very close to it to kill inflation, which went up to 15 percent uh, at the time. But people forget that there was a recession in 1980. It was sharp, but quick. It was over very quickly. It had nothing to do with monetary policy. The Carter administration issued some dopey regulation on a ceiling on credit card interest rates. And the industry said, fine, we're just not going to lend anybody any money. The economy fell instantly, kind of like a smaller version of what happened in 2020 with the with the uh, pandemic panic uh, and then they said oh sorry just kidding and then and then uh, they took the ceiling off and then things got back to normal now this was a time 
when farmers around the country were driving front loaders and tractors to Washington and they were circling the Fed building and one guy drove his tractor up the steps of the Fed and Volcker was being burned in effigy. That I mean, that all happened. So uh, it was a little bit of pressure. And of course, Congress was up in arms and the White House was up in arms. So Volcker, uh, not quite panicked, but he cut interest rates seven percentage points, not 0.7, seven full percentage points to deal with the recession, which number one was unnecessary because the recession was caused by a policy blunder from the White House, which was quickly corrected. And number two, he had not won the fight against inflation. Well, after he cut rates and we came out of that very quick sort of snap recession, inflation got even worse. And that's when Volcker had to raise rates to 20%. And Volcker, in hindsight, he, he said, we, we shouldn't have done that. We should have stuck to our inflation mission. So now Powell, remember Powell's not an economist, he's a lawyer. So he kind of thinks like a lawyer. I can relate to that, you know, looking at both sides. Powell does not want to be that guy. He does not want to be the guy who balks early and cuts rates, the famous Wall Street pivot, before the battle against inflation is won, because the outcome could be exactly what Volcker experienced, which is inflation wasn't done, doesn't go away, comes back stronger, and then you do have to destroy the economy, as we did in 1981-82. That was the worst recession. That was far worse than the little one in 1980. That was the worst since the Great Depression. We've managed to break that record several times since then, but at the time that was horrific. But Volcker and others have said that was a blunder he never should have done. So Powell does not want to give up the rate hikes too early because he does not want to repeat the Volcker mistake. He does not want to be that guy. And that's what's driving him, even as Wall Street screams, you're already there. So, so the question is, how does this play out? In my view, Hal probably is there. He probably is at something like a terminal rate. He probably doesn't have to raise interest rates anymore. He doesn't believe that himself. His models tell him otherwise because they're relying on the Phillips curve, which is junk science. I mean, the last time I looked at a Phillips curve, it was flat. At least where I went to school, curve was curved. This, this thing is flat. There is no correlation between unemployment and inflation. There just isn't. But the Fed thinks there is. So I always tell people, if you want to forecast Fed policy and understand the Fed, don't think like a rational person. You have to think like the Fed. You have to get inside their heads or else you're going to get it wrong. So they're looking at unemployment, which is the lowest, the unemployment rate is the lowest since 1969. Well, if you believe in the Phillips curve, then that's a sure sign of inflation. You know, as I say, even though it's coming down, it's still pretty high. They think they have to keep fighting this fight. But here's what they're missing. Here's where it all falls down. Yeah, inflation as measured, CPI, PPI, you know, uh, personal consumption expenditure, core, non-core, year over year, there are like 20 different ways to measure it. Uh, it is it is coming down, but there are two sources of inflation. And it's going to sound obvious, but you got to separate them, the supply side and the demand side. Both result in price increases, but they have completely different dynamics. Supply side inflation is what we're seeing. It's what we saw in 1974 with the Arab oil embargo during the Arab-Israeli war when they cut us off from oil. And, you know, you had to line up for gasoline. I lived through that. Now, and again, this is what my book Sold Out is about, the breakdown of the supply chain, partly related to energy, partly related to the war in Ukraine, partly related to the pandemic panic. Uh, as I explained in the book, it actually predates that. The breakdown started in 2018 with Trump's trade war. And then COVID made it worse, yes. Ukrainian war made it worse, yes. But it, it really started before that. So, of course, prices went up and people were trying to pay whatever they had to to get what they needed and energy prices were a big driver of that so that feeds through as a form of inflation the other kind of inflation is from the demand side so the supply side is called cost push costs go up and they push it onto the consumers the other kind is from the demand side it's called demand pull and basically consumers have a change in mentality. They're worried about inflation. They would say, hey, you know, I was thinking about buying a refrigerator. Gee, I better go buy it today because if I wait for six months, the price is going to go up uh, or apply that to anything, a new dress, new suit of clothes, whatever. And so you're pulling demand forward and it's behavioral. And that will also drive prices up. But they're very different things. Now, cost push can morph into demand pull. That's what happened in the 70s. It started from the supply side, but by the late 70s, 80s in Volcker, which we've just been talking about, it had tipped over into the demand side. That hasn't happened yet. We've had the supply side inflation, the cost push. It hasn't yet tipped into demand pull. It hasn't really affected consumer behavior that much in terms of uh, people anticipating more inflation. It could, 
but it hasn't happened yet. But here's why that's an important distinction. Cost push inflation negates itself. You know, the old saying that the cure for high oil prices is high oil prices. So it tends to negate itself, whereas demand pull feeds on itself. Powell has not made that distinction. And if I'm right, I think I am right, and the evidence backs that up, this inflation will come down, not because the Fed is raising interest rates, but because higher prices destroy demand all on their own. So it, it does tend to depress um, demand, destroy demand and hurt the economy, and then it slows down and then the inflation comes down on its own. That appears to be happening. But Powell hasn't really made the distinction. He's still, he's fighting the last war, I hate to use a cliche, but he's fighting the Volcker War. Powell doesn't want to repeat the Volcker mistake. He thinks the battle's not won. He has to get to the terminal rate. In reality, he's probably already there. The future is very positive for gold. Uh, you have the normal vectors, you know, uh, supply is flat, but has been for six years. Demand is going up. Central banks have flipped from net sellers to net buyers. That's a big deal. Um, you know, retail and institutional interest is higher. So that's good. Geopolitical threats don't need to say a lot, you know, from the U.S. perspective, Iran, China, North Korea, Venezuela, Russia, you name it. So that's the vector. But the biggest driver right now is what I referred to a few minutes ago, negative real rates. Because gold as a form of money, which is how I view it, competes with other interest rate, com competes with other instruments, treasury bills, et cetera. Well, if they have high yields and gold has no yield, you want the treasury bills. But if uh, if interest rates have negative yields and gold's just flat, gold looks more attractive. So that's the main driver and that's gonna continue. Everyone's like, well, you know, the gold is up, gold is down. Uh, but when the, well, so what do you mean when you say that? And they're talking about the dollar price of gold. And it's like, okay, so the dollar price of gold is up or down. That's really a cross rate. That's so different than talking about the euro, US dollar exchange rate or, or Australian dollar, US dollar exchange rate. If you think of gold as money, and I do, then the dollar price of gold with gold measured by weight, not as another currency, uh, it is another form of money, but with gold measured by weight, it's a cross exchange rate. When the price goes up, I would say that what's really happening is the dollar is going down. In other words, I think of gold by weight. I, I'm interested, you know, do you have a, uh, do you have a ton? Do you have uh, 50 kilos? Do you have five ounces? Whatever you have as an individual investor or as a bank, I think of it by weight because when someone says gold's really going up. I said, well, no, the dollar's going down. You need more dollars to purchase a fixed quantity of gold, which means the dollar's worth less. And when people say, the gold's really going down, I say, no, the dollar's worth more and you need fewer dollars to purchase a quantity of gold. You know, when, you, when people talk about price, the first thing they do is they're really talking about dollars. You know, I mean, this is a euro price for gold, but it, the world market is based on dollars. You're privileging the dollar as the numerator. The numerator is your counting system. You know, is it yards, inches, feet, whatever. And if you put the dollar first and say gold is in dollars and it's going up or down, I think you have it backwards. I think you need to put gold first by weight. And then if it's worth more, the dollar's going down. If it's worth less, the dollar's going up. And so when you say gold is going up, let's say it went to $2,000 an ounce. It was, oh, the price of gold went up, you know, just went up uh, 10%. Um, well, did it or did the dollar go down? Uh, the way I would phrase it is, you know, it used to be $1,800 to get an ounce of gold. Now it's $2,000 to get an ounce of gold or, you know, your dollar got you one eighteen hundredth of an ounce. Today, it only gets you one two thousandth of an ounce. Uh, in other words, gold didn't do anything. It's a metal, it's an element, atomic number 79. What happened was the, the dollar got stronger. So a stronger dollar is a lower dollar price for gold and a weaker dollar is a higher dollar price for gold. So when people talk about gold going up, what they're really talking about is the dollar going down. We have new numbers regarding how much gold central banks are buying, 400 tons in Q3 this year, records and numbers we haven't seen since the 80s. Uh, yet we don't know some of those mystery buyers. Obviously, the theories are that are, that are they are Russia and China. Now, now China is non-transparent. Russia is much more transparent, although Russia is starting to be opaque a little bit because they're in a war. But uh, you can see the inflection point is 2010. So from 1970 to 2010, it's a long stretch, 40 years, central banks were net sellers. It didn't mean everybody sold everything, but Switzerland's down a thousand tons, US was down a thousand tons after losing uh, you know, uh, 8,000 tons, or sorry, 11,000 tons between 1950 and 1970. It was down, down, down. 
2010 was the year that central banks became net buyers. Now, it doesn't mean every central bank was buying gold. It does mean that they were selling a lot less and others were buying more. Uh, and some of the buyers are Mexico, Kazakhstan, Philippines, Vietnam. We know China's a big buyer. We don't know exactly how much Russia was a, as a big buyer. That is continuing. Now the new players, Iran, Iran's not transparent, but we know they're buying gold. Turkey uh, is buying a lot of gold. Uh, Japan had a bunch of gold all along. They never told anybody about one. Literally one month, their reserves went from 600 tons to 900 tons. Well, you know the market. You, you can't buy 300 tons in, in a month, not, not one country in one order. But they had it all along, but they decided to reveal it, put it on their balance sheet. So uh, Americans don't seem to like gold. I'm not sure Canadians feel much differently or others around the world. Uh, but central banks sure do. And I think that tells you something. There's huge demand for dollars all over the world, not because of the currency, but because of collateral, because of treasury bills. Banks need treasury bills to pledge as collateral for derivatives. It's the best collateral in the world. Um, and if you don't have it, you're not going to be able to leverage your balance sheet as much as you would like. You're not going to be as profitable. You're not going to be able to support lending and investing, which is what banks in theory are supposed to do. To, to support the bloated balance sheets and to support the derivatives, you need collateral. And the better the collateral, the more leverage you can have. The best collateral in the world is a treasury bill. And so there's a mad scramble for treasury bills, which means there's a mad scramble for dollars to buy treasury bills. And that is coming from European banks. It's coming from Chinese banks um, and banks around the world, but primarily European and Chinese. And that's not going away. So it's 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 funny to hear people where people think it's funny to hear anyone talk about a dollar collateral shortage like hey haven't you flooded the world with dollars hasn't the fed printed nine trillion dollars and the answer is they have but that's not the measure it's it's a, it's a high multiple of that it's the dollar value of all the collateral because in the repo markets you know i pledge the collateral to you and then you pledge it to somebody else one of our colleagues and then she pledges it to somebody else etc that collateral gets pledged 50 times and supports not one dollar a balance sheet, but fifty dollars a balance sheet for a dollar of collateral. And so you restrict the collateral, you're restricting the balance sheet. The dollar as a reserve currency will not be deposed overnight. But as a payment currency, there's a difference between a reserve currency and a payment currency. Anything can be a payment currency. If I want to pay you with baseball cards and bottle caps and you're okay with that, then it's a it's a currency. So all of these organizations are working on new payment systems right now, and they're going to start to roll them out this year and later. So that's going to be a radical change in how we pay for things. I can give you 20 reasons why the dollar should go down, but I'll give you one big reason why it won't, which is the demand for collateral. And so that's keeping the dollar constant, which is keeping the dollar price of gold constant because gold doesn't change and the dollar's not changing. Now that'll break um, and that'll break in favor of gold, meaning the dollar will get a lot weaker. It'll have to, but it's gonna take a few months at least because the US economy has to get weaker, which it is. The Fed will figure this out maybe by September, ne next September. Um, and uh, then they'll ease a little bit and they'll try to weaken the dollar to try to give the U.S. economy a boost, but we're not there yet. So it's going to be now that doesn't mean the price of gold is going down a lot. I'm just saying it's not going to go up a lot. It's going to chug along kind of sideways. But when it breaks, it's going to break big to the upside because the dollar is going to go to the downside. But that's probably at least um, still a few months away, maybe longer.